Well, good morning and welcome to our worship service here on Sunday, April the 19th. And we invite you to worship along with us this morning. Sing along with our praise team. Grab your Bible and uh, follow along with our message this morning. We also want you to know that we are posting our daily devotions uh, Monday through Friday morning. We also have available for you online through YouTube and Facebook uh, Youth Bible Studies by Pastor Rod, uh, our children's lessons, and uh, this past week our praise team recorded eight of your favorite hymns for you to be able to worship and sing along and, and uh, praise the Lord with at home. So you can check out any of those on YouTube or on mine or other members' Facebook pages so you have an opportunity to worship along with us. We miss you and love you, and I hope that uh, this worship service is something that you can participate in and uh, worship and bless the Lord with us this morning. Thank you.
was there by faith, I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. to 
I think that might be the most favorite praise song that we have ever done. Ain't no grave. What an awesome promise during this time and uh, the promise of knowing that one day we get to spend eternity in heaven. I invite you to open your Bible today to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to begin by looking at just one verse there this morning. Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 1. Our message today is entitled, Two Sides of the Hills. Two Sides of the Hills. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 1. The Bible says, And seeing the multitudes, Jesus went up unto a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. I want to share with you today about three hills. Not just three hills, but three specific hills in the life and ministry of Jesus. You know, someone once said there's a difference between a canyon and a valley. A valley has two ends. Someone also said there's a difference between a cliff and a hill. A cliff just has one side, but a hill has two sides, and that's going to be part of our message this morning. The Bible speaks much about mountains and hills throughout it. Noah's ark came to rest on a mountain. Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. 
Goliath stood on one mountain and the army of Israel on the other mountain, and he challenged them. Much of Jesus' life and ministry happened in the hills of Judea and Galilee. But I want us to focus on three of those hills, perhaps the three most famous or familiar hills in the New Testament. I want us to focus on that mountain overlooking the Sea of Galilee. I want us to look at the mountain that Jesus Christ would die on, Mount Calvary. And then third, when Jesus would leave this earth and ascend back into heaven on the Mount of Olives and see what those three different places have to teach us. First of all, on a mountain overlooking the Sea of Galilee, Jesus will speak to our hearts. It must have been a beautiful setting there overlooking the Sea of Galilee. Jesus would deliver what is recorded, at least, as his longest teaching time. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew chapter 5 through 7, we hear what Jesus had to say to his disciples. You see, all of those folks were religious, but they had a religion about what not to do and what they should do. And the problem with their religion was that it had become a series of going through the motions. Do this, don't do this, and they believed that God would be pleased with them. But when Jesus came, he shared a different, a revolutionary new way of teaching different from what they had been accustomed to. And Jesus began to speak right to the heart of the people. And in that most famous sermon that Jesus preached, he preached about love, about forgiveness, he taught them how to pray, shared with them what you and I often call the golden rule. It was a message to the heart. And that first hill that we look at, that one overlooking the Sea of Galilee, Jesus would speak to the hearts of the people. But remember, I told you at the beginning that a hill has two sides. And even though we see that most beautiful scene of Jesus reaching out and speaking to the hearts of the folks there on the mountain overlooking the Sea of Galilee, there's also another side of that hill. Those followers who swarmed to see and hear Jesus that day would in just a short period of time all leave. They'd all abandon him, and they'd all give up on him. You see, there were two sides to the hill. The side of followers and those who listened to every word to the other side of the hill where they all left and abandoned the Lord. I wonder, what side of that hill are you on right now? Maybe there was a time in your life that you followed God. Maybe there was a time in your life that you trusted Christ. Maybe there was a time that you spent time in His Word. You went to church. But now, you're on the other side of the hill. It's time to move. In that first hill, we see Jesus speaking to the heart. But let's look at another hill, a hill called Mount Calvary. And there, Jesus reaches for the heart. All four of the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, share the terrible and gruesome story of Jesus' arrest, his trial, the beatings, the mockings, and the crucifixion. And then he would be led away to a place called Golgotha, literally the place of the skull. Interesting, we are much more familiar not with the name Golgotha, but with the name Calvary. And if you do a word search and begin to learn, you know that Golgotha means the place of the skull, and in fact, several of the gospel writers tell us that that was what the meaning of the place was. But only one of those gospel writers 
would not use the term Golgotha, but would use the term we're, for more, for, we're more familiar with, and that is Calvary. The place Golgotha means place of the skull. The word Calvary means a smaller or tiny skull. I got to thinking about it and kind of glad that we used the term Calvary because that's what's in our songs. Can you imagine if we still used Golgotha as the primary one? Our song might be, I believe in a mount called Golgotha. Just doesn't sound quite the same, does it? But on that hill, Jesus Christ would be nailed to a cross and he would die. Why? For you and for me. He would suffer and he would die. He would shed his blood nailed to that cross because he loves you and because he loves me. And there he'd give his life. You see, that hill called Mount Calvary is the most important place in Scripture because it is all that the Old Testament looked for, the coming of the Messiah who would come to be the sacrifice for our sin. And those Jews in that time all believed that religion would somehow get them to heaven. They were convinced that just being a Jew and trying to keep the law would make it. But Jesus had already spoke to their hearts about what God really wanted. And then Jesus would die on a cross and shed his blood to show, to demonstrate that God does love us and that God proved his love. And that's the only way to come to God. And I don't know what side of that hill you're on. I know what side I'm on, but I don't know what side of that hill you're on. Have you come to the place in your life where you've given your life to God? I don't just mean, yeah, God, I, I'm, I'm trying to give you my life. But I mean, have you come to that place where you've asked God to forgive your sin? You told him you're sorry for it. And you've put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that Savior that died on that cross. And you've given God your life. We have a lot of terms for that. We call it salvation. We call it being born again. We call it regeneration. It's a moment that happens in your life where you bow, ask God for forgiveness, and trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It is the most important decision you'll ever make in your life, and I hope it's a decision you'll make. Wherever you're watching this, home, in the nursing home, wherever you might be, right where you are, you can trust Christ. Tell God you're sorry. Put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as the way to heaven. And tell God, I'm yours. I give you my life, and I accept you as my Savior and my Lord. Take over. If you'll do that, God will forgive your sin, adopt you as his child. It is, without a doubt, the greatest decision I ever made in my life because now I know which side of that hill I'm on. One day, I'll spend eternity in heaven, all because Jesus Christ went to that hill called Calvary and he reached my heart. But I did share that there was another side of the hill. It's amazing to think that if you read the account in the Gospels, especially in the account of Luke, he shares one rather unique thing about the story of Jesus' trial that none of the other writers share. In fact, unless you spend some time studying God's Word, it might be something you've overlooked before. But Luke shares that while Jesus was going to trial before Pilate and then Herod and back to Pilate, Luke shares that Pilate and Herod couldn't stand one another. They didn't get along. They didn't like each other. But after both of them had interviewed and tried Christ, Luke tells us they became friends. Wow, that's rather unique. 
But I want you to know there's another side of the hill that's dark. The religious leaders of Jesus' day, those Jewish people, were looking for the Messiah. They desperately had prayed for, they desperately wanted that Messiah to come because they wanted that Messiah to set up his kingdom right here in Jerusalem, set up his kingdom on earth and overthrow Rome. Those Jewish people wanted that more than anything else. They wanted that Messiah to come to overthrow Rome. And yet, if you study Jesus' trial and crucifixion, you find a dark side to the hill. And in fact, John is the one who records it. You can get your Bible out and check out towards the end of the Gospel of John this week and study it a little bit more. But those very same Jewish leaders that wanted the Messiah to come, that wanted Rome to be overthrown, those very same people that said they hated Rome and wanted it overthrown. John records that they would announce their overwhelming devotion to Rome if it meant killing Jesus. Check it out in the Gospel of John. Check out in Luke how Pilate and Herod became friends after Jesus' trial. Yeah, there's a dark side to that mountain as well. Then I want to share a third mountain with you. We looked at the mount overlooking the Sea of Galilee, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where he speaks to our heart. We looked at Mount Calvary, where Jesus reaches to our heart. And now I want us to focus on hill number three, and that's the Mount of Olives. And it is there that Jesus encourages the heart. After Jesus rose from the grave, he appeared to his disciples and followers a number of times. In fact, as I was looking at that this past week, at some of those appearances, some to a few of the disciples and on a few occasions to many of the disciples, and it struck me this week, all of those disciples had abandoned Jesus. Peter denied him. Judas had killed himself, and they'd all left. And yet, one of the most beautiful pictures of love you find tucked away in the appearances of the resurrection of Jesus after he comes out of the grave, and he meets with those disciples. And there are no condemning words, only love. Those very disciples that had abandoned him, even Peter, who had vehemently denied him, no condemning words. What an awesome picture that is. And then Jesus would go to the Mount of Olives. He would prepare to go back to heaven, and he was going to leave his disciples and his followers. And they get to Mount of Olives just east of Jerusalem. And Jesus would share with them that he was leaving, but that he would come again. It is on that mount that he encourages us. That though he was leaving and though he was sending the comforter of the Holy Spirit, Jesus was coming back. But with that announcement came a commandment. It's repeated in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. We call it the Great Commission. But Jesus not only encouraged the hearts of the believers that day, he motivated them. And he motivated you and I as believers. And that motivation is that you and I should be witnesses. And yet, that seems to bring us to the other side of that hill, too. From being there with Jesus and him saying, I'm coming again, and him saying, go and share the gospel with all the world, there's another side of the hill. 
And tragically, most of the people who call themselves Christians, most of the people who call themselves followers of Christ, very rarely, if ever, share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the dark side of the hill. Which side of the hill are you on? Are you on the side of the hill that looks forward to Jesus Christ coming back and you're not only encouraged by it, but you're motivated by it and you're sharing the gospel with the people you come in contact with? Or are you on the other side of the hill? Almost as if you're keeping it a secret. And you're not purposely sharing the gospel of Christ. Which side of the hill are you on? Let me share a short story about two men. Henry got up on Sunday morning, and as he was accustomed to, out the front of the house, get into his car to head to church, because that's what he did on Sunday. As he was headed out to the car to go to church, his neighbor was coming out at about the same time. His neighbor had his golf clubs in his hand, and he hollered over at Henry, and he said, Hey, Henry, why don't you come and play golf with me today? And Henry hollered back over and said, Hey, you know, this is the Lord's Day. I go to church. I can't play golf. And the neighbor threw his golf clubs in the trunk, and before Henry could get into his car, his neighbor walked over to the fence and he said, Henry, could I ask you a question? Henry said, well, of course you can. And he said, I've asked you to play golf with me a whole bunch of times. Why haven't you ever invited me to go to church with you? Yeah. I imagine you could hear a pin drop there, too. I've invited you to play golf with me a number of times. Why haven't you ever invited me to church? You see, that's the other side of the hill. Our mandate to go into all the world and to share the gospel, that means as you go in your world, wherever your life takes you this week, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Which side of the hill are you on? We looked at three hills today. The first hill that speaks to our heart. If you're a child of God and you want to know how God wants you to live, hey, you can follow the words of Jesus in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It speaks to the heart and it tells you how you should genuinely live before God and others. The second hill, Calvary. He reaches to the heart. And I don't know what side you're on, but I hope and pray today that you're on the side of the hill that says, I know him. I've trusted him. I've given him my life. I've asked for forgiveness. And I'm a child of God. And if that's something you're doing today, if that's something you'd like to know more about, and if, especially if you did it today, I'd love to talk and pray with you about that. You can contact our church. You can contact our church website and leave an email there for us, fbcwaldo.org, fbcwaldo.org. I'd love to communicate with you. You can call our church office right here at First Baptist Church of Waldo. We'd like to know how we can pray with and for you and if you've got another question or two or five about your standing with God, I would love to talk to you about it so that you can know which side of the hill you're on. And then that third hill, the Mount of Olives, where Jesus not only encouraged his believers and told us he was coming again, but he also motivated us to be a witness. And so today, right where you are, I invite you to make an altar. Maybe it's hill number one to say, God, I've got to live godly. Maybe it's hill number two where you've got to give your heart and life to God. Maybe it's hill number three where you need to make a commitment that says, I am going to 
purposely share the gospel of Jesus Christ this week. And I encourage wherever you are that you make that your altar and you make a commitment to God. And if you do, we want to pray with you about it. We want to rejoice with you. We want to encourage you. We want the opportunity to disciple you. And we want especially the opportunity to rejoice if you've trusted Christ. We'd love to hear from you. Make it your altar right there where you are. We love you. We miss you. We look forward to being able to worship again corporately together. But no, the message of the gospel is still going out. We're still worshiping the Lord. We love you. Thank you.